Well, welcome everyone. Um, James Atkins from Vantage Strategy Marketing and uh, welcome to this webinar. And thanks to Russell and Ray from Strategic Business Development who organised these uh, webinars. Today we're going to focus uh, on an area that gets lots of airtime and is sometimes framed as a choice, strategy or execution, execution or strategy. And I think uh, that's a really bad way of thinking about it because they are, they naturally have to be interconnected. Uh, and so what we'll talk about today is four key elements about making them interconnected. We'll explore some tools and models to, to help with that interconnection um, and talk about some of the areas that I've found effective. Hopefully you've all got the workbook. Um, afterwards, this presentation will be sent to you and it's as, as we said earlier, it's being recorded and there's an opportunity for question and answers as we go through. Please feel free to use the, the question and answer section on, on, this, on the system. Uh, we will move through at a reasonably quick pace, um, but all of these things, as you can uh, imagine, take a bit longer than 30 minutes to explore. So I encourage you to take the workbook and take some of the exercises and spend some time with a group of your colleagues exploring them. A bit about myself, for those who don't know, I, I work with businesses and their leaders, helping them to refine their strategy and improve their execution, predominantly so they can grow either sales or profit or people. Uh, I work mainly with medium to large organisations where sales and marketing uh, are an important factor in helping them grow. So let's let's uh, let's kick off. I've seen this said a number of times: a medium strategy well executed is better than a great strategy uh, poorly ex poorly executed. I can't actually find who said it, though I do believe a banker from the United States just before the GFC trotted it out. So I'm not sure how effective it is, because I think it's quite a cop-out. Why do you need to choose between a mediocre, uh, well-executed strategy and a, and a brilliant so-called poorly executed one? I think that's flawed. We need to sort of change the way we think about this strategy versus execution issue and start to think about strategy and, and execution. Uh, issue is because they're interconnected and as I said we'll talk about four key elements and the four key elements that I think help with the interconnection and help you have a great strategy and great execution uh, are these four things and that's what we'll explore today. Firstly it's about making choices. Strategy is all about choices, uh, what you're going to do but just about as much as about what you're not going to do and critically uh, ensuring that you're in those choices developing competitive advantage and we'll do an exercise to challenge that tonight. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce you to a model that's reasonably new um, that, that I've used with some clients that seems to uh, generate the right sorts of debates and discussions. The second area is around alignment. Um, firstly, how you cascade that strategy, but also how you set uh, tangible, clear business plans and, uh, and, and make sure they're cascading. The third area and the critical one is setting priorities. There's no doubt everyone in business has too many priorities, but how do you, you cut your strategy and your plan into bite-sized chunks and decide what you're going to focus on right here, right now? Similarly, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little time on, on that tonight. And finally, and most critically, how do you create accountability? Uh, how you operate, how you align it, how you meet, review and communicate, and how you ensure that this is all part of your cycle setting and tracking, creating visibility, communicating and importantly supporting and empowering your people. So the first area is around making choices. Now, I find this, these doors, which door are you going to go through? Are you going to do anything, i.e. so you haven't made strategic choices, do everything because you you've, haven't set priorities or end up doing nothing because you actually haven't got a clear view. Michael Porter, the, the so-called doyen of strategy, talks about it all being about making choices and trade-offs and about deliberately choosing to be different. And to being different, I think, then comes to this strategic mo planning model that those of you involved with Mindshot would have seen about really being clear of what your sustainable competitive advantage is. Is it around differentiation or cost, for instance, and how that defines your marketing strategy, how you operate, and then supported by innovation HR. So I think this is a really, really important model because it, it gets the heart of competitive advantage. But there's a there's a book that I've read recently that, that I really encourage people to grab onto, which is called Playing to Win 
by Laffley and Martin. Laffley was the former when he, CEO of Procter and Gamble. In fact, he's gone back there again just in the last 12 months. And Roger Martin was part of Michael Porter's um, strategy consulting group, and he was you know, Procter and Gamble's sort of um, most trusted advisor. And they came up with the framework that's outlined in Playing to Win. Uh, and it's what they use. And I've now used it with a number of clients and I've heard of a number of organisations using it. And it's around five key sets of choices. Sets of choices around you know, what is your winning aspiration? So what's your, what is it that's going to motivate and inspire your people? Uh, where will you play? What's the geographies or products or parts of the value chain? Uh, how will you win? What's your value proposition and your competitive advantage? And what capabilities do you need to reinforce those activities? And what systems do you need to make sure it's being supported and monitored? And as you can see from this diagram, it's a cascading process because they're interconnected and reinforcing. The where will you play and the how will you win area is clearly um, critical to competitive advantage. And it's that combination, the set of choices you make there that really under, underpins, underpins your strategy. But then importantly, ensuring you've got the right set of capabilities to, to do that. I'd like to take you through an example that's shown in the book and, and really does it well. It's from Procter & Gamble around um, oil of your land, as it was called in Australia, or LA, as it was called, as is called in the States. And in 1995, oil of LA was a $750 million business, but it was a fading brand and, and market share was, was, was declining. And they acquired, Procter & Gamble acquired it with the view that it would give their, them as a parent company a foothold in the beauty business where they weren't really. It was another plank they wanted to have. But what was pretty clear to Procter & Gamble was that Oil of LA was not playing to play. It was in fact, it was not playing to win. It was in fact playing to win. But it wasn't playing to win, sorry, it was playing to play. And here's an example of how they would at a high level describe the strategy at that time. Um, they really were a player in the global market it didn't really have an inspiring, motivating aspiration. They're in fact shrinking their position rather than growing. Um, they targeted older women and was a pretty uh, low level, single purpose um, for wrinkles product. Um, and it didn't have any strength across markets or across brands. They, they were really leveraging scale, but the brand positioning was pretty classic. It wasn't particularly differentiated and the capabilities didn't support uh, where they were heading. And uh, it, it was really a brand with no differentiation. It was a low cost player and as, as, as I said, was declining. As part of the acquisition strategy uh, and then when they got their hands on the product, they re revised their from playing to play to playing to win. And they looked to make this, as, as I indicated, a pillar in their business. And they repositioned it around younger women um, just noticing the first signs of ageing selling it through mass channels and they looked at, to fight the multiple signs of aging. So going from an older, older, older person's product single focused around wrinkles to being a much broader area. And they in fact moved it up market, establishing what's known as the Mastige channel, one of the first Mastige products, Mass Prestige. Uh, and they were effectively leveraging strength that, that Procter & Gamble had in terms of the channels that they worked in. Uh, and they realised the capabilities they needed as they looked to, to fight the seven signs of ageing was innovation in product and distribution and in consumer understanding. And in particular, they needed partnerings with universities and technologists to start that, that innovation. So it was, a, it was quite a significant shift from playing to play to playing to win. And that then became, there's now a 2.5 billion from a 750 million business to a 2.5 billion brand. And for those who don't know about these sorts of products, they have very high margin, they've got number one market share and they're positioned where they wanted in the beauty business. So it's a, it's a really uh, interesting case study in using this, this model to redefine who you are, how you're going to make choices and which, where you are and where you're not. So, um, how would you get started if you were to do this process yourself? Here's the, the five steps that I suggest. Firstly, I would like, um, they did for uh, Olay, is actually to map out your current strategy. Not what you want it to be, but being really honest about what it is. What is your current strategy if someone was to look at it from outside? What is the effect of it? And then, as a management team, 
identify the key strategic challenges and opportunities you are facing in the market uh, and you are facing as an organisation. Be really honest about, about those based on the effective strategy that, you, that you're currently delivering to. And then as you think about those strategic challenges and opportunities, define the ones that create the greatest opportunity or the greatest challenge and start to develop where to play and how to, our op how to win options, the two cores of competitive advantage to address those challenges and to make the most of those opportunities. So you may have three to four challenges and opportunities, develop different options, different scenarios around that. And then as a team, debate, discuss, argue, whatever works for you as a group and start to make choices. How are you going to then reframe your strategy in whole or in part to take advantage of these challenges and opportunities and to ensure you're playing to, to win, not playing to play. So it's a pretty simple, simple process, but it starts, uh, I've noticed, the right sort of conversations around making choice. So for the first exercise tonight, uh, if you'd open your workbook, I'd like you to do two things. Firstly, I'd like you to, to quickly jot down what are you, that first step in the process about mapping out your current strategies. Where do you currently play and how do you currently win? Write down what they are and then challenge yourself. Is it distinctive, either from a customer or a competitive perspective? And would you rate yourself as are you playing to win or are you just playing to play? Which is it? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to drop down where you play and how you win and then we'll come back uh, after, after a minute. Thank you. As this is a recorded version of this webinar, please press pause, complete the exercise, and then play when you're ready to go again. Thank you. Okay. So as I said, this is something that is probably best done with a group um, and is, is a really you know, good kickstart to the strategy process. So talking about making choices, the sec second area is around um, aligning everyone, aligning your strategy, aligning your pl planning and reinforcing how you operate. And if you think about the, the Lafley and Martin model that they use at Procter and Gamble, um, it, it's around actually creating cascades from a corporate level to strategic to individual business and in their, in their instance, an individual product. And I think making sure that you have those cascades are really important. And it's, it's not that, that, that they necessarily are identical, though core capabilities I think are really critical in terms of leveraging them. And in the case of Procter & Gamble, they look to, to, for instance, leverage the core capabilities around their strengths in the mass channel. But it's around making sure they're concrete and specific of the choices you have. And, and in larger organisations, it's a way for, for the overall um, strategy to ensure that it is being reflected, but also that you're uncovering at a brand level capabilities or strengths or competitive advantage or systems that in fact may be able to be leveraged further up in the group, you know, those hidden gems within your organisation. But of course, strategy is not planning. Um, and you then need to look at what are your business priorities? And those of you uh, that have worked with me on the Mind Shop Now Where How process are obviously familiar with a one page plan, which is a really great way to determine yeah, that's your strategy, but what are, the, what are the initiatives we're going to do this year as an organisation? What are the strategies we're going to focus on in terms of this year? And how do they cascade to departments or teams and, and even down to individual, individual um, leaders? So that cascading process, both at a strategy and a business planning process, is really important. But the biggest challenge I see is that there are too many priorities. Everyone says that they have you know, the hurdles of you know, time constraints, blockers, low energy, um, real issues of too many initiatives, initiative overload. Yes, I understand the strategy where we want to be in three years time. I understand in fact what our goals are for the year, but what does that mean uh, right now, here, right now? And I think this is, this is where that cascading and alignment process is really important. And it's about incorporating how you plan and you review it as you do strategy. Because we should be able to focus on what I think are a limited number of priorities for a set period. A certain discipline about limiting your priorities and setting a period of time to focus on. That, that is on the path towards your strategy and is a path towards the delivery of your plan. 
because that I think ensures improved execution, ensuring you're focusing on the critical few. Not that difficult in concept, um, uh, but it demands quite significant discipline in, in delivery. And what I do now with, with, with clients is in fact this exercise that we'll do in a second. It's okay, we're clear on the strategy, we're clear on the objectives and the plan for the year, but what are all the priorities you're focused on at the moment now? Let's, let's brainstorm them all. And you normally know end up with a huge mind map. Think forward then three or six months, whatever the time frame or the nature of your cycle, I think it's becoming shorter rather than longer, but let's, let's say three or six months, possibly three. What is it critical for you to achieve within that three or six month period? What is the most critical for you as a business initially, as an executive team, as a business team, as a, shorter, a smaller group? What is critical for you to do? What are your top three to five? No more than that. Um, and there's all sorts of research to indicate um, focus on, on those sort of numbers, the, the handful, so to speak. But what is the number one? What's the most critical for you to achieve? Now this exercise can be a really effective way for you to then think through, this is our strategy, this is our business plan, but what are we going to do in the next 90, 120, 180 days, whatever the right time frame and cycle is for you as, as a business. Um, and, it, and ensuring, uh, and that then cascades down. So I'd like you to the second exercise tonight, just open your, your workbooks and look at what are the top three, what, brainstorm all your priorities, write them down and think of it is either as yourself as a business, yourself as an individual or as the business executive team and then write down what are the top three to five but what's the number one, what will matter in three, four, five or six months time depending on the cycle. So I'll give you a quick minute to do that. As this is a recorded version of this webinar, please press pause, complete the exercise, and then play when you're ready to go again. Thank you. Okay, I hope you've all been able to identify your number one. And, and I suggest, you know, this is also, if, if uh, you're not the CEO and you report to someone, this is also a really, really valuable conversation you can have with your boss around, this is what I'm focused on the next 90 days. Um, this is what my team's focused on the next 90 days. Do you agree? Is this what success looks like? Because we all have annual um, KPIs and annual measures, but what's important right now um, and how it sits in that context. So we've talked about strategy being all around choices and we've talked about um, aligning, making sure we align the strategy um, and then setting priorities and being really focused on the short term in terms on the path towards it. The final sort of element that I'd like to talk about is around creating accountability. And um, I, this, this is obviously key. And obviously we have a, everyone has a process, hopefully a plan, do, check, act, being really focused around continual improvement, but how do you set your strategy, your business plans and your priorities into processes in a business cycle um, to ensure that you're keeping focus on it, ensuring that all those other things aren't getting in the way? How does it fit in how you operate? How does it fit in your meetings, your discussions, your debate? Now, um, I can't hear you all, but I'm, I'm sure there'd be a, gr a collective groan if I meant, uh, mention the word meetings. And you know we have weekly meetings, project meetings, daily, the year in review, quarterly, monthly, all sorts of meetings. And in fact, I think people groan is because it's largely, or in many cases, are wasted opportunities. Um, and, I, and unsurprisingly, uh, people sit and accept inefficiency. They ensure that they're sitting with the view when they walk into, a, into an annual or a quarterly review. And because I think it's what's happening is they lack focus. They mix up purpose. Um, they mix up purpose of the different types of meetings and ensure uh, focus is around that, that you have an, an appropriate cycle, that daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly and annually, whatever your right cycle is, have clear, clear purposes, um, clear agendas and aligned communications protocols. Uh, and what I've done with a number of clients is get them to agree what is their purpose and their structure uh, of their meetings. So for instance, here's an example. And some people say, oh, I can't have a daily meeting, but, but organisations, particularly ones that are quite operational, um, have for many years had what you'd call toolbox meetings. And there's no reason, um, especially if you're located in, in, the, in the same area, in the same location, more difficult if you're geographically spread, spread either across Australia or globally. But what are, what are the, you know, 
what is the way that you set touch base? And some people do it daily, some people do it two or three times a week. And the focus is on the operations, is around making connections, communicating with people, identifying any obstacle, short term obstacles, not solving them, taking those issues offline, but spending time touching base, making sure you're connected to the business, but it's very operational. Then on a weekly basis, the purpose of the meeting is around tactics. It's a one, one hour meeting that's all about the weekly dashboard. It's about remedial actions to, fi to fix any gaps, to look at your priorities, so the top three to five priorities that you've set. So this is about integrating priorities into your process. What are the barriers just in this 90 or 120 day period to achieving it? Making sure you're integrating between teams, but importantly, sharing good news. And then monthly, not, is not talk about remedial actions or, or weekly issues, but it's around what was the last month's p &L, what was the last month's KPIs, how are we going with our, with our priorities and what strategic issues are coming on the horizon. So a performance based outcome. And then quarterly is very much around setting those quarterly priorities, our quarterly or 120 days, whatever's right for you. What were the last period's priorities? What's the next period's? And what are the strategic issues that we should work on together as a team? That's what's half to one day, depending on where you want to get a broader group of people to focus on. And also, how are we working to do? What's the mechanics? What's the dynamics of our mechanics? How are we actually engaging? What's our pro how's our process going? How are we focusing on our meetings? How are we communicating? And then on an annual basis, obviously, reviewing your annual um, performance, reviewing and refining a strategy, maybe going through those five choice questions we talked about before and setting the clear business objectives and plan for, for the next year. I find this structure and purpose creates focus and accountability. It enables the people that are responsible for the priorities to report against them, but to report against them at the right time and in the right context, not mixing up individual things that have occurred on a daily basis in a quarterly review and requires real agenda management to do that. And the output of all of these also need to be how are you going to communicate um, the progress and priorities to other people. And part of that's around obviously ensuring KPIs are set clearly around your priorities and your overall business, BAU business objectives, but also tracking and reporting your progress, communicating that and making visible. We've got clients that, that put up their top three to five priorities in each of the major um, meeting room areas or, or um, uh, lunch rooms and they use traffic light system to say, you know, green, they're on target to being achieved, amber, there's problems and green, uh, red, we're in real, prob real trouble. And obviously if they're red, they then are escalated to the weekly meeting uh, for discussion by the executive. And then that, in, in that organisation that I'm referring to, those um, uh, top priorities are cascaded down from the executive to the department to the team, so three levels of priorities. Um, so making it visible, but also empowering real-time learning. So if people are coming up with problems or challenges, how do you in fact you know, give them pro problem solving um, mechanisms and methods? And those of you on here would be aware of the MindShop uh, online system that, that enables you to cap capture and track your priorities and your strategies and link those to professional online development tools. So this is a you know, just-in-time bite-sized approach. So, so if you're having a, a block around a particular priority or strategy, um, it enables people to find solutions. So this is a, another way of creating accountability um, from individuals but also providing them a tool. Another really, really effective and uh, low, low, uh, low touch, low tech approach is actually to create an accountability body. And uh, what quite often works if you've got a, a 90 day um, review meeting is actually um, find someone else in the room, not your boss, but someone else that you can work with that becomes your accountability body. Write that buddy, write down what you're going to achieve and help, and help them to help you be accountable. Um, and I think that uh, that really helps people focus on the right here, right now. So in, in wrapping up, it's uh, I think there's four elements to make it a conversation about strategy and execution rather than strategy versus execution. It's about writing the make, making the right choices and that Blaffey and Martin model is a great way to uh, uncover and have great conversations, but also to focus on um, key issues of where do you play and how do you win, the core of competitive advantage. Alignment's critical, ensuring strategy is cascaded, business plans are cascaded and they're really clearly set. Uh, and that then focuses on what's important right now. How are you setting those priorities and translating into uh, bite-sized chunks? 
and finally uh, creating that accountability partly around the alignment but also how you meet, how you review, how you communicate, what's, how does strategy and planning become of how, part of how you operate, your, set your cycle so, and uh, how do you make it visible and, and empower people to be able to deliver. So I, I've found that those four areas with the number of tools we've talked about are great ways to make it about strategy and execution, not strategy versus execution. Uh, two books I suggest, uh, I mentioned the Laffley and Martin one earlier, but also the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. He has um, a number of uh, interesting uh, insights, particularly around the priorities area that's, that's worth a read. So um, uh, you'll obviously, uh, there's a lot to take in there, I encourage you to talk to your, pay, talk to your um, uh, colleagues, use some of these tools in, um, in your sessions. Do, are there any questions that anyone, anyone has that I'd like to, like to raise? Feel free if you um, haven't got an accountability buddy to email me with your number one priority for tonight uh, and I'm happy to uh, be your accountability buddy and send you the odd email or text to remind you about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's really important to be able to, 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 get, to get that focus. So that's uh, all for tonight. As, as I said earlier, this session is uh, recorded. Uh, you'll be sent a link to the session afterwards. You've got a copy of the workbook and presentation. Um, if you'd like more information, please feel free to send me an email or, or give me a call um, and subscribe to the newsletter uh, at my website if you want more tips on these types of issues. And there'll be more workshops like these, more webinars like these from Russell and Ray and look forward uh, to, to, uh, to being involved with those over the next few months and uh, wish you all the best in getting success with the uh, execution of your strategies. Thanks very much.